Hi, Liam, are you there? Good morning, Shyama. Hi, Liam. So, you know, these are the questions for you, okay, about the differences between high income and middle income countries. By the way, Liam, how many countries have you worked in or worked on? Engineers Without Borders, I mean, this is such a lovely name. What does it do, actually? That's a good question. Maybe, Shyama, if you can stop sharing, I can share some very yes. brief slides. Yes. It's, it's uh, a... Now, sorry, you should be able to see my screen now. Yes. Yeah, good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. And thanks, Shama, for organizing this. It's been very interesting. Yeah, we're a little bit uh, schizophrenic because we work in high-income and low-income countries. So I, I have a number of jobs, but only one salary, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm uh, the Director of Engineers Without Borders and also work in a development technology in the Community Research Centre in TU Dublin. So in answer, Shama, we've worked and I've lived in Africa and in, in mostly West Africa and Central Africa and um, Southeast Asia. Um, we do a lot of work in Europe with the, with the European uh, community, with Brussels, but also in South America and Central America. So, so we kind of straddle high income and low income countries. And, and it's interesting that uh, your, I think your first question you asked me was, you know, what's the different sanitation problems in high income and low income countries? And I'm sure many of you are probably sitting there thinking, why are we talking about high income countries? Surely, you know, it's all sorted. Um, well, maybe just just to, very briefly, like there are some trends that I see. For example, talk about Ireland, where, where I'm from. I'm calling you from Dublin at the moment. Um, we have large scale infrastructure that doesn't work. 50% of our wastewater plants do not meet EU requirements. We also have an urban rural divide. Where have you heard that before? Many of the low-income countries I work, uh, this is a major challenge. We have one of the most dispersed populations in Europe. And we have 32 towns, mainly along the West Coast, that discharge raw sewage every day of the year into our rivers and lakes. We also have a challenge with financing community infrastructure and very interesting uh, discussion from Valentin. I was really interested, Shyama, uh, to hear their approach. But in Ireland, the State Water Utility have said that it's not economic to provide wastewater facilities for less than 2,000 people. And then you talk about VIP latrines, Shyama. We have VIP latrines, but we call them septic tanks. About half a million people in Ireland have septic tanks. And, and again, a septic tank is a great solution if it's constructed properly, sited properly, operated properly. And a lot of our, our on-site uh, wastewater treatment ends up polluting. So I see a lot of similarities in the challenges, you know, in high income and low income countries. Um, and I think, Shama, you, you asked me a second question there. And again, I, I've been told that the only people who speak English faster than Indians are Irish. So uh, if, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to speak slowly. But one of the questions, you know, was, is lack of formal sanitation a problem or an opportunity? And, and when Shyama asked me this question, I was thinking, when I lived in Africa, in, in a couple of different countries, uh, and, and Valentin alluded to it earlier, I had two or three mobile phones. I had, I had great mobile coverage. I had pretty good internet in most places, even in Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali. I moved back to Ireland. I have no mobile coverage in my house. I have to come to the office today uh, because I can't talk to you because we have no broadband in my house. And, and I said, like, what's happening? And one of the things is we have a legacy of infrastructure that's not fit for purpose. And a lot of low-income countries do not have this uh, legacy. So they have a possibility to engage in what we call leapfrog technology. And I know some of you are, are getting a little skeptical out there. So uh, can you see this picture, Shyama? Yes, I can. What do you think this is? Um, a nice garden. Mm -hmm. There's a little pond. It looks yeah. nice. I might go there, you know, to relax. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice park. You can picnic. Uh, there's actually a hotel. The rooms you see uh, skirted on the outside are quite an expensive hotel, actually. It's in a place called uh, Don Pipi Island off uh, the coast of uh, Thailand. And 
it's an example of what I talk about this leapfrog technology because uh, as Shyama mentioned, I was also involved. I was the reconstruction manager with the Red Cross in Southeast Asia after tsunami. And this is an example where their infrastructure was wiped out and they had to start again. What you're looking at there is a high tech wastewater treatment plant. That's what it is. Uh, of course, it looks quite attractive, but it's an example of what we call hybrid infrastructure. And hybrid infrastructure, maybe some of you might have a hybrid car, you know, which has electric and petrol. It's, it's a combination of traditional gray infrastructure, which is engineered, and natural infrastructure, nature-based solutions. Um, so there is an opportunity. There are lots of challenges. But if we think differently about the problem, we possibly have an opportunity to create more dynamic infrastructure. Um, and back to the, the solution of choice. Uh, I think you, your third question, Shyama, was about um, VIP or ordinary pit latrines. Yeah. And, you, and I know you, you've a big interest in this and you asked me, are they, are they safe? You often ask me this. And my answer would be yes, no, and maybe. And, and people who work with me know I often answer things like that. <laughs> but three things, location, construction, operation. The, the, the pit really does nothing, only store a little bit of degradation. The soil is what's treating everything. So if they're poorly sited, if the soil is, is not um, not proper, if the water table is not uh, is in, inadequate, if they're in the wrong location, you've created a problem. Construction, poorly constructed, often poorly constructed. Um, and operation, you've created a supply chain. You have to empty it. You've created sludge. So your solution has actually created a problem. And then my biggest problem, Shyama, which, uh, which, sorry, which, uh, uh, here, yeah. this is my biggest problem. You've heard of the fortune at the base of the pyramid. This was yeah. a, an economic book years ago. There's a fortune at the base of the pit latrine. <laughs> there's nutrients, there's organics, there's liquid gold. So if you thought differently about it, this is a massive opportunity uh, to harness these resources. This picture you're seeing, I really like it. It's, I, I can't take any credit for it. It's an exhibition by two colleges in Dublin at a big, massive gardening exhibition called Bloom every year. Um, and it's getting people to think differently about it. Um, and I think the last question, and, and I know you're conscious of time, Shyama, you yeah. then said to me wh when we were chatting was, okay, you have all these ideas, right? What would a climate resilient sanitation system look like in yes. your world? Well, the first thing I'd say, Shyam, is stop. Right? You can't solve the problems with the same thinking you used when you created them. We are, engineers are very traditional. We build based on past experience and we are very risk averse. Um, we have a, a design program in Ireland called Where There Is No Engineer. And one of my colleagues says, uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, <laughs> but you know, it says, you know, what would a climate resilient sanitation infrastructure look like? Well, I would suggest it would be dynamic. It would change every year according to the climate. How would you do that? Hybrid. You need to incorporate high-tech engineering with low-tech, what we call nature-based solutions. It should use low power no chemicals. And really, it should focus on the circular economy of water. Reuse, recycle, recover, um, rather than disposing. And again, I can sense, I can't see everyone, so I presume a lot of people are sceptical. Uh, they normally are when I present. So the pictures I've shown are actually lots of different countries we've worked in, examples of this technology across Europe and, and elsewhere. Um, so once we start thinking differently about the problem, then the question becomes, and, and Valentin and, and it, excellent work uh, being done has, has tackled this a lot, what is appropriate sanitation technology? Our approach to it is that it's tactile, modular, plug and play. You can interact with it and understand it. It's plug and play, which means if one part fails, you take that out, you replace it with another part. So you look at the supply chain. Um, and then that raises the question, and I know I'm answering your questions with a question, Shyama, but can you actually create a model for self-supply water sanitation? Well, Valentin has shown that, that you can. In our work, 
what you're looking at there is what we call our village technology education centers, where masons, carpenters, um, teachers, community members come in and interact with the technology, understand it. And then they in turn become teachers and trainers themselves. And that raises the question in Ireland, as much as India, as much as Africa, what's the role of the community? Are they merely the user, which most engineers would say they are? I would question that. I would say, surely they're the designer, the contractor, the operator, the financier. Um, and examples there are from our projects in Liberia, where, where we developed these systems that were, again, not subsidized, zero subsidy. If a household wanted the technology, they had to, to figure out how to pay for it. But it was creating this, this need and this want. And then the last thing, just to, to leave you with, and this is a question that's often raised, does low cost mean low tech? Um, and no one wants a poor person's product. You have experienced it in Finn's work uh, with Ecosan, and you had it in the video there. And this is an example from Bolivia, from one of our partners, Emas, uh, in Lake Titicaca. And we often say, actually, low cost means high tech. Because in order to get efficiencies uh, into technology and make them low cost, you really have to think about the solutions. You're looking at a VIP latrine that is powered there by the wind uh, and has an aircon system in it. Doesn't look like it. You're looking at solar showers, which the campesinos use um, in, in the local villages. And you're looking at a local campesino family there that has a total sanitation and rainwater and hot shower solution. So you've made something aspirational. It's low cost. So there's a queue of people wanting this technology. And if you want something, then you create inevitably a way of uh, wanting to maintain it. Because if it's broken, there's a value attached to, to this system. So these are the kind of things where, where we're trying to break the chain. Um, and I would leave you with, you know, if we think differently about the problem, and think of it as an opportunity, forget our past traditional infrastructure and create new solutions based on natural uh, dynamic systems, then we start to address the problem. And I, I leave you with this, uh, with this comment for those of you who get depressed, and I often do at the scale of the challenge, but I'm actually quite excited also because I think we're living in really exciting times and there's a lot of drive now for change and for thinking differently and interacting differently. And I really think now uh, the time is right for a lot of these ideas to become um, mainstreamed. So I hope you could understand me, Shyama. Yes, yes. <laughs> thanks, thanks for asking me to participate. It's been a really interesting morning. It, it and was, uh, I'll hand yeah. back to you now.